on Mars, we would have a feeling like we're just not familiar with. Do you feel lighter than you do on Earth? Like that sort of strange sensation you have when you're walking in an airplane and it, and it starts to descend. On Mars, life will feel both strangely familiar and unlike anything we've ever experienced before. Extreme isolation, tens of millions of miles from home. As we adjust to living on the red planet and work to make it more like our Earth, inside our bodies, something extraordinary will begin to take place. If humans end up living on other planets like Mars, that could trigger evolutionary changes that might lead us down a path by which we eventually become new species of humans. In the distant future, ready or not, we will become Martian. Humans are built for our planet. Our bodies are really configured to allow us to walk around on two legs with exactly the amount of gravity that we experience here on the surface of the Earth. Our hearts are adapted to be able to provide blood to all of the parts of our body under Earth gravity conditions. Our eyes are really well adapted to see in the light conditions here on Earth. Our brains evolved to help us to make sense of the environment that our species evolved in. These changes to our bodies took place over grand scales of time, so gradually that our ancestors never perceived how they were adapting to their changing world. And now, Humans are approaching the moment when they will leave Earth for Mars, a planet with conditions that neither we nor our ancestors ever faced before. We're always under evolutionary pressure, but nothing like what people living on Mars will experience. The challenges to adapt to conditions on Mars will be more extreme than almost anything that's happened in the history of evolution here on Earth. Thanks to the International Space Station, though, we can start to get a glimpse of the kinds of changes our bodies will go through once we leave Earth. The, the most significant hazard present on the International Space Station is a lack of gravity. Aboard the ISS in low Earth orbit, some of the effects of microgravity become apparent quickly. When you go into microgravity, a significant amount of your blood volume shifts to your upper body. And you see the crew members, the pictures demonstrate it quite well. Their faces get very puffy. The fluid inside your head shifts as well. And you're disrupted by the idea of my ears are clogged, my nose is stuffy, my eyes are watering. It may not actually be a negative impact on how your brain functions, but part of your thought process is distracted by the distress you feel. You're just uncomfortable. That persistent discomfort might play a role in a phenomenon astronauts often complain about known as space fog. The crew members feel fuzzy, their functions start to slow down, and it takes them longer and longer to do, you know, pretty regular procedures that we all take for granted. Inside the astronauts' bodies, the lower gravity is driving more substantial changes to the muscular and skeletal systems. The body is trying to understand the lack of signal, the body is stopping its investment in things like bone and muscle. Bones become more weak and brittle. And one particular muscle experiences an especially dramatic change. In a lower gravity environment, we expect the heart to become weaker because it won't have to pump quite as hard to be able to move blood all around the body. After a routine mission to space lasting a few months to a year, Astronauts can typically rebuild their muscle and bone mass after they return to Earth. But we don't know how our bodies would react if that mission to space ended instead on the surface of Mars, where the gravity is just three-eighths as strong as the Earth's. 
Would we ever regain the strength we had on our home planet? If you've watched any of the rovers land, it's a rough landing. So we have to think about protecting the crew because they're no longer as robust as they were when they left Earth. The potential danger of a broken bone would threaten humans as long as they stayed on Mars. Imagine breaking a bone on Mars and losing the ability to manipulate objects with your hands or to move your wrist. If you have a broken bone on Mars, that's gonna make it really hard to do all of the intense physical labor that's gonna be necessary to make a living and to thrive in the Martian environment. You know, the austerity of the environment takes, you know, an issue that here on Earth we could fix to something that is catastrophic and or fatal. How our bodies respond to Mars gravity will not only affect those first settlers, it may also affect the evolution of our species, if we're able to reproduce on the planet. Those who will pass their genes on to the next generation will more likely be those who experience less cognitive decline and who tend to grow denser bones, even in low gravity, than their peers. And while the ability to perform manual labor on this hard scrabble landscape is one area where having denser bones could be a benefit, denser bones would be even more essential to women during pregnancy. During pregnancy, a woman's bones already become brittle because some of the calcium from her skeleton is being transferred to the growing fetus's skeleton. At the same time, increasing amounts of pressure are placed on the pelvis, one of our most remarkable adaptations. The pelvis allowed us to walk upright as humans and it's the bone which helps females support their wombs during pregnancy and later deliver their babies. If women experience a fractured pelvis during childbirth, that could threaten her life and the life of the baby. And that means that women that have relatively denser bones would be less likely to fracture a pelvis during childbirth. And that would make them more likely to survive and to be able to pass on their genes for stronger bones. Another possibility is if childbirth is just too risky, we might see a rise in cesarean section births. Interestingly, if we have a situation where most births are through a C-section, that actually could free up the head to become larger and larger because the head would no longer be constrained by having to fit through the birth canal. The idea that when there's a lot of C-section births, the head could become larger, is supported by studies here on Earth that have found that in places where C-sections are especially common, like in the US and Brazil, the heads of babies are already becoming noticeably larger. Over time, humans on Mars could develop thicker frames or larger heads than their Earth-bound relatives. But to succeed on Mars, our species will need to adapt to more than just Mars low gravity. We'll need to develop some protections against the persistent radiation that engulfs the planet. Radiation which has the power to mutate our genes and perhaps accelerate our rate of evolutionary change. So out in space, there are all these energized particles moving very, very quickly through the solar system, close to the speed of light. Some of them come from our sun, and some of them are coming from far outside our solar system. Mars lacks a magnetic field, and without a magnetic field, particles can actually go down and impact the surface of Mars. Like UV radiation, the kind of radiation that we're familiar with on Earth, those can also cause damage to the molecules in your body. For the first wave of settlers, this could lead to increased rates of cancer. Subsequent generations would be impacted further. When you think about reproducing on something like the Mars surface, DNA damage can definitely be passed along. The generational scale of the effects of radiation are something we'd really want to understand better before we decide we're going to start having families on the surface of Mars. And these just aren't experiments we can do. Um, on humans, and on some level, the first people to go live on Mars will be our experiments. 
this is part of the uncertainty inherent in our future evolution. In all living organisms, mutations give species an opportunity to experiment with different survival strategies. Some of these mutations will lead to failure. Some, however, could lead to surprising successful adaptations. We know that the pigments in our skin here on Earth help protect us from the intense ultraviolet radiation from the sun. People that live in different parts of the Earth have adapted to the different ultraviolet radiation environments by evolving different amounts of the skin pigment eumelanin. Eumelanin is a natural sunscreen that protects our skin from damaging ultraviolet light. It's possible that people living on Mars will adapt skin pigmentation that increases their ability to tolerate the intense radiation that we experience on the surface of Mars. And the skin pigmentation that evolves out of life on Mars could look like what we find here on Earth. Or it could be an entirely new pigment for our species. Here on Earth, some organisms use carotenoids to protect themselves from radiation. Carotenoids are what give carrots their orange color. And beta-carotene is an example of a carotenoid that can be found in sunscreen because it helps protect from ultraviolet light. It's possible that mutations could arise that lead to carotenoids like beta-carotene being produced in the skin of people on Mars. That could make people on Mars develop orange skin. Shrunken hearts, heavy skeletons, large heads, and orange skin. Whatever gives us an advantage for surviving Mars' grueling surface conditions will become more common in each new generation. But evolution is often a grindingly slow process, and there is no guarantee that a Martian colony would survive long enough to see these beneficial adaptations become common in future generations. So what could we do now to ensure the success of a permanent Martian settlement? It might come down to whom we select to be the first settlers. I think the first people that will go to Mars are gonna to have to, first of all, be really hardy. <laughs> We'd want a diversity of skills, a diversity of outlooks, a diversity of talents to make sure that all of these, these components that make human culture are being accommodated by that group. For the Mars missions, uh, when you think about the diversity of skills, it runs across many disciplines. Geologists, agricultural specialists, biologists, physicists, astronomers, because all of those skills would be necessary, not only to do the science, but to understand how to use and exist in the environment that's present. And even more important than skill diversity will be genetic diversity. The one thing that keeps on resonating across all of biology is that the more diverse, the better. Why? Because it gives you a pool of opportunity to be responsive and adaptive. When you talk about the genetic basis for success, you know, for any one gene that, that represents a vulnerability, it also represents a resource. The collection of genetic traits that make it to Mars will determine how future settlers will look, behave, and adapt to the planet. In the field of evolutionary biology, this is known as the founder effect, and the more genetic breath the founders carry with them, the better chance we'll have of developing the right formula for successful human life on Mars. To illustrate how the founder effect works, we can use colored gumballs to reflect some of the genetic diversity of the first Martians, each color representing a unique version of a specific gene, known as an allele. So if we take only a small number of individuals, it's possible that we will leave out some of the genetic diversity that's present here on Earth. And that could be dangerous because some of those traits in the genes present here on Earth might be valuable in the Martian environment in ways that are hard for us to anticipate. What if the red gumball was an allele that gave people the ability to fight cancer caused by the high radiation environment on Mars? We might not know that in advance, but by leaving out some of the diversity present on Earth, 
we lose the ability to benefit from those genes when we get to Mars. Humans hold some 20,000 genes. And when you consider the number of variants or alleles those genes can exhibit, it becomes clear just how much genetic diversity our planet's population holds. By sending the most diverse founding population possible, we better our chances of bringing with us the advantageous cancer-fighting allele, represented by the red gumball. So if this red trait ends up being really beneficial in the Martian environment, then in the next generation, it might become more common. Eventually, over several generations, it might become very common. And as generations pass, it might eventually be present in all individuals. This is the way that natural selection works. It makes traits that are beneficial more common from one generation to the next. If that cancer-fighting red trait were present among the original founders, humans could adapt more quickly and more effectively. There could also be mutations that arise that cause completely new versions of a trait that aren't present at all on Earth. And maybe this now represents an even more potent anti-cancer gene that makes it even more likely that people can survive in the intense radiation environment on Mars. And so that trait would spread even quicker and replace pre-existing traits in the population in just a few generations. A Martian population all sharing this anti-cancer trait, a trait unique to the planet Mars, would be making a profound evolutionary leap. The longer that people on Mars remain isolated from people on Earth, the more new traits they'll acquire. Eventually, over time, people acquiring new traits on Mars will look more and more different from people on Earth. And eventually, will give rise to a new human species on Mars. Eventually, we will become Martian. The challenges of settling on Mars are infinite, but there will always be a degree of uncertainty present that we probably will never eliminate, and that's, that's what exploration is about. Um, I think that's what drives us to continue to move forward. As a scientist, I'm hopeful that we can survive on Mars. I think it's possible that we'll be able to get through all of the challenges that Mars will give us and be able to actually live and survive. This will be one of the most incredible achievements, not only in our history, but in the history of all life.